our uh, final plenary session. Um, Pia has been. Um, does anybody here not know Pia or of Pia? Okay. Uh, wait, no, you're lying. So actually, most of you are lying. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, most of you are lying, but for those of you who aren't, um, uh, Peer War has been uh, in the Australian free and open source software community forever. Uh, and she's been particularly instrumental in um, uh, making open government stuff happen in Australia. And uh, she's done an amazing job of that. So please, everybody, uh, welcome virtual Peer to the stage. She, she can't be here in person because she's involved in a, a very important project fork, as it were. Um, so, please welcome Pierre War. Well, thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here. I am talking. It's lovely to be here. I wish I could be there. It's really good. Um, as it turns out, I'm I'm now actually forking my own new project that you might all like to see. Who, does anyone want to hear about my new project? If you love the code, let it free, right? Anyway, so um, what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about um, about open sourcing government. You know, one of my one of my favourite topics, and uh, particularly to talk to you guys about. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about where it's been, where it is now, um, some of the lessons learned, and what I've realised have been the critical things that make our community so awesome, and that, that make our community um, so successful. In changing not just government but the world, I thought I thought uh, that might be a useful sort of conversation starter. So, the first thing is that there has actually been a significant change over the last um, 15 years. So I've sort of been involved in trying to change government attitudes about open uh, about open source for 15 years, and um, it makes me feel a little bit old to even realise that. But it's um it's been a it's been a really difficult journey in some ways because 15 years ago you'd try to have a reasonable conversation about open source and you'd be told, oh, no, security risks, um, uh, there's no, um, there's no um, industry around it, there's no support, why would I want to take on something that doesn't work? You know, it, you just got all these things that were just thrown at you by default. What's happened, though, in the last 15 years is that um, not only has it tipped the other way so significantly, and I'll, I'll get to why in a moment, but it's got to the point where I, and you'll all find this funny because you know me, I'll be at events or, or in meetings with people talking about, you know, projects or, or some development we need to do or some project, and someone will say to me, oh, Pia, look, I don't, I don't really feel comfortable contributing to this unless we can be sure that the, the code that we develop is open sourced. And, I'll, and I'm like, I, I think I can handle that. I think we can do that. I think that's be a <clears throat> but that's a massive turnaround. To have that kind of turnaround is um, a significant win for us and for how, uh, I guess, you know, open source, a tribute to how open source has really started to become normalised. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk through why I think this has happened to some degree. Um, I want to have a, a sort of bunch of questions at the end because I'm sure that you all have a lot of questions about what's sort of going on in government at the moment anyway. But I think that that, that change is um, for a bunch of reasons and um, and I think that part of that change is because of what open source means, not just as a technology stack, hello, Donwa, um, not just as a technology um, you know, a, a methodology, but also what open source does to people. Because fundamentally, the people that are leaders in our community are fit for purpose to actually be leaders everywhere. You see open source people, um, you know, taking over everywhere, taking over a private sector, taking over government, taking over community organisations in the most beautiful and wonderful possible way, not in a bad way. But open source actually makes us as people more effective and more awesome at what we can do. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, but I, I guess I wanted to kick off by saying um, that I think that every success that I've had in my career and in what I've achieved in government, in, you know, in a whole bunch of different places, 
is actually because of um, how I was trained and the intuition and the instincts that I developed by being involved in the open source community for so many years. So on behalf of the entire open source community, um, you know, you representing them just for the purpose of this, I'm just going to say thank you <laughs> for for helping me, you know, be awesome. Um, and I think that we, you know, I think that that's an important thing to recognize. All right. So 15 years ago, um, how many people, I'll just get up to show of hands, how many people have been in, in IT for more than five years? Uh, that's everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. More than 10 years? More it's, than 15 um, years? It's, 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 it's still kind of everybody. Uh, there's only a few exceptions. Anyone more than 25 years? Um, yeah, cool. Okay, a couple. A few. All right. Um, I, think that, um, I think that what I've observed over the last, I guess, 20 years of my um, sort of working in, in IT, or I guess 15, 16 professionally, is that the, the big shift has been from this black box magic wand style of IT of don't worry, it's, it, it's technology, I'll take care of it, you don't need to think about it, to now having a lot more of an informed um, discussion. There's still a lot of people that just outsource even thinking about IT, which really sucks, but, um, but you know we have a lot more people that are thinking about it in a strategic way and realising that the technologies that they choose are directly related to their success in what they're trying to do. And I always like to tell people, you know, you can have the best policy in the world, you can have the best idea, you can have the best strategy, but if you don't have really awesome geeks in the room from the start, not just at the end to implement your idea, but in the strategic part of your, your project, you're going to fail. And um, the best kind of geeks in my mind are open source geeks because uh, of all the instincts that we bring to the game. But a lot of, um, a lot of people are actually starting to take that seriously now. We may not have 100% of the population engaged with technology generally, but um, to have them starting to recognize and respect and want to engage with us is a, is a big change. And I think that's really useful. Um, so, you know, 15 years ago when I um, started looking at um, open source in government or open source more broadly in, in, in government, um, it was all about this sort of black box idea. We there were people uh, 15 years ago and 10 years ago who were really pioneering trying to get open source into government, both inside government and outside of government. Um, I certainly was one of them, but there were many. And um, with varying levels of success and frustration, and you know, there's a few people in the room that have done a lot of work as well. Um, but it was very frustrating. It felt like you're banging your head against the wall all the time. Now it feels like the wall has become thinner. Now, I'm hoping it's not just because our skulls have become thicker. All right, I'm hoping that it's actually the wall is breaking down. Um, and I'm certainly seeing evidence that it is breaking down. The key reason to that is in the first instance, and this is going to not be um, a surprise for some of you, but it's actually because of the web. So open source web technologies were probably the big tipping point in government. So IT departments are... Um, very difficult to move. They're, they're, they're very stuck in their ways and they're very conservative. But quite often the web development um, in a government department is not done by the IT department. It's done by the comms department or done by a, you know, by, by someone else in, in the organisation that's not IT. And so they ended up not being um, constrained to some of the assumptions that IT department had. And you ended up with people saying, well, why wouldn't we do you know, a, a WordPress or a Drupal or a Joomla or a Mamba or any of those, you know, other ones that we can remember um, when it's cheaper and better and faster and gives me all the flexibility that I need and all that kind of good stuff. And um, and when IT sort of would say, well, you know, what maybe we've got something different to say, it was kind of irrelevant because it's like, oh, well, it's okay, we can just put it up on the cloud. We don't actually have to be limited to what IT tell us they can and can't do. So it's been largely through the massive adoption of the web and web technologies across government that created that tipping point for open source absolutely proliferating. And that changed, that brought with it a change of attitude, which has started to now get broader. Um, there's still people in IT departments who remain completely stoic in the idea that, um, and completely um, stuck on the idea that, you know, open source is a threat. And the funny thing is that now it's not just the open source advocate saying, well, that's just not true. Now it's all the other people in the organization, you know, the data people, the analytics people, the um, web people that are saying, but open source tools are the best tools that we have to use. I heard about an example in a department who does 
some amazing stuff with data because obviously data is my current kind of um, little passion. Um, but um, and they just wanted to use one of the the world's best um, analysis tools, a tool called R, which is like a statistical analysis tool. It's a wonderful open source project, and it's also a wonderful open source community. Some of the best statisticians in the world use and participate in that community and share their knowledge and their you know and their hacks and all that kind of cool stuff. It's really good. So a particular department wanted to use R to do some really complex, awesome stuff. And um, their IT department said, no, but we'll buy you this $20 million piece of software to do it because we you know, we already know those guys. And they're like, no, 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 we just want to use this free thing. We don't want the $20 million thing <laughs> because it won't actually achieve, it won't do what we need it to do. We want the free thing. And, and eventually they won, so that was good. But the, the idea that we're going to buy what we're familiar with is getting in the way of being able to do the right thing, you know, and being able to do the best thing and being able to follow the path of the technical integrity, which of course is so important to us. So we've seen this huge shift. We've seen this huge change. Um, and I, uh, I'll talk about a couple of specific projects, but um, you know, uh, there's, there's always been open source in the science agencies and the agencies that do research and science. But the difference is that 15 years ago it was hidden. 10 years ago it was hidden. 10 years ago when you know we used to go and talk to NICDA and CSIRO and, and research organizations and universities, and I, I actually did a research project um, many years ago when I was working in the um, Macquarie University at a thing called the Australian Service for Knowledge and Open Source Software, which was an interesting little project. And I did a research project looking at the use of open source in the higher education space. And all of them would say, oh, of course we use it, but, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> and you'd be like, why? <laughs> And they say, oh, oh, you know, we well, maybe investors won't want to invest if it's an open source, or maybe people will be worried about security, or maybe because our IT people don't know and we don't want them to know. And there was all these sort of, you know, there's all this skunk works happening behind the scenes, secretly and privately. And um, the difference now is that several of those organisations actively embrace open source. I mean, for many years, the only truly successful um, spin out from NICTA was um, uh, OK Labs? Uh, no, OK Labs. I've got OK Labs in my brain. Um, yeah, OK Labs. The Open Kernel people, um, and and um, Gernot Heiser and his team, who built you know a micro kernel for um, for a phone, and it was all open source. And they'd been building it for a little while, and then one day, an international major phone company um, rang them and said, mobile phone company, and said, we, we'd like to use your your product. Can we get a contract and start getting services with you? And they said, oh, that's cool. Well, would you, if you'd like to check it out, here's the software and here's the GitHub and whatever. And the company said, oh, no, we've been using it for a year. We've been testing it and playing with it. And we found it's completely fit for purpose and we love it and we want to um, to, to get contracts with you. And so it was very good. So um, And now there's a whole bunch of those sort of projects coming out of research and science agencies that are openly open source, and that's quite good. Um, but science has always been there. Um, I know there's a whole bunch of little projects like Xena, the archives project, National Archives project to create archived, um, ar um, um, standards-based archival of, of government content and information. And you know, that was built open source and it was a really big deal uh, at the time. Um, there's been, I think, a bit of a maturation around maturity around security principles. Because when you tried to talk security, you know, um, 15 years ago, you'd be told, Oh no, obscurity is the best way to be secure. And um, you know, we all know that actually no. Uh, peer review, many eyes make all bugs shallow, all of those kinds of good things. So, and and now when you have the conversation with people, there is that recognition that actually um, uh, visibility helps identify security issues that they can be fixed more effectively. And that that's a big shift in, in thinking as well. Um, I spoke about analytics, and obviously, you know, pretty much anything I touch ends up being open source. Just and the funny thing is, I don't need to explain myself anymore. Um, when um, when we did um, DataGovAU and re-released that, I looked at the market, and you know, and I looked at every product that was available. And the reason we chose CCAN, an open source product, wasn't because um, you know it, it was the only sort of contender, but the flexibility it gave us, and the the uh, you know the ability to add and remove and be responsive to the changing needs of um, data publishers and data users, like open source actually gives us flexibility in government to create better products and better services and better government. And that's coming through loud and clear. And there's a whole new generation of people joining government that are starting to understand that, which is really great. So I guess the key question is, um, so obviously the web adoption has been a tipping point in adoption 
of open source. And through adoption, we've seen a change in attitudes and policy and perspectives. There has been for some time now a policy that says that all procurements, government procurements should assess and um, and look at open source options. But, um, and, and, and every agency is supposed to do that. Um, but of course, you still end up with constrained with the, the internal assumptions and cultural, you know, um, resistance of, of um, parts of the organization at times but we've had this you know this this um, um, I guess movement that uh, has really made it a lot more acceptable in the last in the last 10 years which is uh, which has changed that behavior significantly so so I guess what I want to talk a little bit about now is why has open source become so influential um, and I think it's because our community have some key attributes that make us a bit special and make us a bit different make us you know who we are and what we are and make our code and make our projects what they are as well so the first one and i mean none of these are going to be strange to you all but i think it's sometimes useful to sit back and reflect on the fact that we're not like everybody else <laughs> um and um and if we know what makes us different then maybe we can help other people become more like us um you know and be more awesome in, in these ways too so the first one is kind of the hacker uh, the hacker maker ethic you know, we, we're very just do it yourself, you know, JFDI kind of mentality. And the funny thing is in government, I find a lot of people have a learned helplessness. They sort of say, oh, I can't possibly change things because that's just how it is. And that's how I was told to do it. When I got into my first job in the federal government, I automated about 70% of my job in the first two weeks. And then I said, now I want data over you. And I got it. So, you know, it, it worked. Um, but the idea of automating stuff. So I remember talking to, like I had three particular reports, for instance, that I had to do on a weekly basis. And I looked at the reports and I said, well, they're all basically the same thing. They're just in different formats given to different people. Why wouldn't I just do it once and send it to the three people? And they resisted strongly. They said, oh, well, you know, um, oh, you, you can't change the format. You can't change the, the project. Anyway, how about you sign off on the waste of time and effort? Oh. Sorry, I didn't get the microphone. That was my fault. Okay. Um, so, I, so I said, I'll, here's how much time it takes to do your way and here's how much time it takes to do my way. So you sign off on the fact that your way is four times as long as my way and that that's an appropriate use of government resources and I'll do it. And they're like, oh, no, I can't, I can't sign that. <laughs> so, um, There's this learned helplessness. And I remember giving a speech about, um, I, I, I called it something wanky, like a collaborative innovation. I basically was saying, we're not going to get more money to do the same thing in government. We're gonna, not going to get more money to do more in government. We're probably not even going to get the same money to do the same. We might have the same money to do more, but most likely we're going to have less money to do more, which makes people's brains explode a bit, right? But the fact that government agencies and people that work in government need to think a hell of a lot more creatively about how to get things done. That means using things like open source, using, um, you know, collaborating with other people, building solutions in, you know, with multiple different parties involved rather than trying to do it all yourself, rather than starting from the premise of here's what I have to do, the minimum that I have to do, here's the resources and budget that I have available to it. So how can I do what I need to do with, what I have available to me, rather than starting from that premise, starting from a global premise. Well, someone else has probably done this before. <laughs> someone else probably wants to do this. Um, I've done heaps of projects now where I've found three or four or five different groups across several departments or several jurisdictions even, or even private sector or even community people and sort of said, okay, well, you want to do this, we want to do this as well. You're interested in that bit, we're interested in this bit. How about we you know, throw some resources in together? How about we get a few people hacking in a room together? How about we figure out how to do this together? So I have this whole talk about thinking more co more collaboratively as a creative way to solve problems more effectively. And it was a, a long talk and I, I was all um, public service sort of people. At the very end of the speech, someone said to me, so Pia, what are you going to do to help me collaborate? And I, I just was like, really? That's your question? Like, you need to collaborate. <laughs> if someone else is doing it on behalf of you, it's not going to work. Our community is very um, self-directed, self-motivated, um, and, you know, we just get up and do it. If something needs to be done, well, why can't I do it? 
you know, and, and there's this as assumption of routing around damage if, dam you know, in, in damage may be social or it may be um, technical, um, but routing around damage in order to get something done. And that ethic, I think, really drives us. It's that leadership through doing, it's that, that joy of solving wicked problems in a, in a clever way and, and hopefully in a beautiful way, but at least in a clever way. Um, and we're a very empowered group of people. So when we go into an environment like government, where there's so many disempowered people, you know, we become natural leaders and we become natural, um, um, you know, we become naturally successful in that kind of environment. Government tends to think about things in a really big way. We tend to think about things in a small iterative way. So, you know, we'll fail early, fail often, but come out with something amazing. Um, and that's really challenging a lot of the government assumptions about how projects should be run in a good way, in a really good way. And starting to show people that they don't have to have billions or hundreds of millions or tens of millions of dollars to do what, you know, could be done in with a lot less money and in a lot better a way in the first place. So that's really cool. Um, second of all, we're very outcomes focused. We, <laughs> if you can't, if, if it doesn't actually work, then it doesn't work. If there's nothing to show, then then you haven't done anything. You, you are judged in our community based on your contributions, whether it's code or community or documentation or um, or testing or bug fixes. You're actually judged on your on your uh, on your contributions, and I think that's really powerful. In a lot of other organisations or a lot of other um, social settings, you're judged on your background, you're judged on your reputation, you're judged on all kinds of other things. But in our community. Um, that meritocracy or, or technocracy or, or whatever you want to call it, I think is very powerful because when I'm dealing in a, sitting in a room surrounded with people who are talking about building a policy document as the outcome and I sort of say, well, but, but, but what does that actually do? What's the impact? What is, how does it affect society? What's the actual outcome of the policy going to be? And oh, no, no, the policy document is the outcome. Well, no, that's not good enough. So because we're so outcomes driven, we tend to, deal with and um, make a world around us that's very pragmatic, that's very tangible, that, that's um, very touchable, which I think is very important. Okay, so um, so we're very outcomes focused. And, and part of that is also we follow naturally, and it sometimes ends in a lot of flame wars and tears, as I know, um, but we try to follow the path of technical integrity. We take joy in the path of technical integrity. We take joy in um, basically saying this is the best way to do something. We don't get caught up in the politics of, you know, whether I want to do it. Well, there's certainly politics in open source. I'm not saying there's not. But um, at a core principle, we care about the technical integrity of what we do. And that's a really powerful thing. And I've certainly found that very useful in government. Being that community focused, you know, seeing the world as our and naturally collaborative is, is really good, but also that mutual appreciation. You know, when I see someone do something cool, I, I tell them, you know, that's awesome. Well done. Congratulations. That's really cool. This, this mutual appreciation that we have in our community is very helpful, not just because it helps build that, that cycle of, um, of satisfaction, but also because it, you know, when, when lots of people get behind something, then it can be very successful. And I found in government, it's just amazing how few people really appreciate each other. And when I say to someone, that was a really good job, they're just taken aback. Oh, I well, thank you. No, no one ever told me that before. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's a really powerful thing because when you can create momentum and you can empower people, then then you know they become a lot stronger and a lot more um, capable of, of, of awesomeness. Obviously, there's some basic technical um, attributes that we have in our community. So you know, having a, a modular-based approach, having a standards-based architecture, taking a Unix perspective that says that we'll use the best tool for the job, and then we'll use lots of the best tools rather than huge, you know, um, behemoth, single arc, uh, single infrastructure that can't be used for anything else. Be because we take that modular architecture thinking and we have that as part of our, our basic um, design, that ends up being very powerful as well because rather than being locked into a particular product or a particular um, stack, we end up, you know, being able to build these interoperable systems that can actually be very responsive and adaptive and um, to new needs, which um, again is, is very rare in government. People are only really starting now to go, oh, what if we take a modular architecture approach? I mean, the, the term agile has become rather overused as you'd all know, um, but the reality of the fact of the matter is that um, we work that way by default. So we can teach those people those instincts and actually help them 
stop building billion dollar systems, um, which is good and a good use of taxpayers' money and all that kind of stuff. Um, as I mentioned before, the power to fork is a very important attribute of our community because it allows you to say, you know what, that is not how I want to, to run. Um, so, I mean, some, you know, as you know, some forks are for good reasons, some are for not so good reasons, but the power to fork at all creates um, a bit of a, um, a sanity check to make sure you're going in the right direction. In government, you know, you see projects that have been very big and a lot of money gone into them, and then people feel committed to keep going in that direction because they're already committed in that direction. I think that our community have the instinct that says, but there's all, you know, if there's a better direction, let's just do that. And, and having that natural challenge of the idea of just, you know, keep going down a path because you've already gone down that path before is, is a good um, instinct of ours as well. Um, and I spoke a little bit before about the many eyes and the peer review. Um, things like, and I mean, GovHack is obviously a community, organ a community event. It's not a government run event, although it's heavily government supported now, which is quite exciting. But, you know, to, to have a, you know, what was a tiny little fun side project turn into something so big and so successful has been um, really quite humbling and quite amazing. And I mean, Richard's in the room and he's been chatting about that, I think, earlier. And he's uh, one of the, the key drivers there. And uh, so, you know, make sure you buy him a drink if you get a chance because he deserves it. Um, but GovHack is so, coming from a government perspective, is so profound because a lot of government people, decision makers, see GovHack and go, but they, they made in two days what we've been trying to build for two years. And it's like, yeah, I know, right, you're welcome. Um, and they see GovHack and they go, oh, what if some of our developers go to GovHack and participate in the team? And you go, yeah, yeah, do that. And um, so this year, one of the departments, one of the big departments that wasn't officially involved in any way, but they said to their staff, you can participate in GovHack and have that time in lieu if you want as a, as a formal way to support staff of participating in the weekend. So they had 15 staff turn up, um, you know, and split into four or five different teams and had an amazing time and it was the best professional development they've ever had. Terrifying when you think about how much money is spent on formal professional development, you know, three to $5,000 a day courses, um, that people can get in a room and just hack for fun and learn more that way. It's that hands-on learning from other people and not just learning code, but learning a new way of thinking and a new way of working and a new way of, of um, bringing together different things to do cool stuff. Um, the other effect on government, which is quite profound, is it's really getting government to realise that it's not, and I talk about this quite often, it's not a king in the castle anymore. <laughs> it's a node in the network. And when government agencies and staff and whole governments start to realise what that means profoundly, it changes their behaviour. So rather than trying to lock everything up or rather than trying to be the centre rather than trying to, you know, be the only um, path to something, um, they start to think, oh, well, maybe someone else wants can do this better than I can. Maybe I can just do this bit. Maybe I can be part of an ecosystem rather than trying to own it, so to speak. So th there's been a lot of profound changes that are intuit intuitive for us that government are just catching up on. I've always sort of said that um, the, you know, that one of the things that the internet did was massively distribute power from traditional organisations to the people. And we have now the most powerful people ever in the history of our species, and we're only getting more powerful every day, which, which I, I don't think we can overstate how important that is because the, what that does is it challenges government, it challenges organisations, it challenges multinationals, it challenges the status quo environment as we see it and starts to make it into something else. And it already has started to make it into something else. So governments are in some cases struggling, um, in, some case, in some ways embracing, but having to, having to change. And open source um, technology, community, methodologies, open source thinking, um, free culture thinking, you know, free software thinking, uh, I think has provided a, a, a huge step up to helping um, these kinds of people that are not our people traditionally become more um, part of the network, which I think is very important. So I think um, that was kind of the key points that I wanted to make. I'm actually running early, but I think we were running early to start. 
Um, what I might do is just throw out for a couple of questions now and then I'll jump onto a slightly different topic. Okay. Can you, you can hear us, right? Yes. Good. Any questions? Hello. You don't know me. I'm Mrs. Tim. <laughs> Um, I am involved in a project where we're trying to get the, a government agency to do a thing they don't want to do because they're so risk averse. Do you have any yep. words of advice? All right. Risk, it's funny actually because I, I have a lot of fun with, um, with risk and how risk is perceived in government agencies. So um, Quite often the question is asked, I'll give you my practical advice. Quite often the question is asked, what is the risk of doing this? And then you sort of have to say, oh, here are all the risks of doing this, things that might go wrong, rah, rah. I like to slip into that same conversation and to the same formal documentation that goes up the line. What's the risk if we don't do this? Now that is not often done. <clears throat> and by saying the risk of not doing this is that you know, we continue to fail in the scene, we continue to overspend over here, we continue to have this problem here or something new happens or we're not going to be able to respond to this this situation. The, the risk of not doing something needs to be better articulated because quite often we need, you know, they need to change and they're, not, um, and, and they're not clear as to why they need to change. So they just see it as you're trying to get them to do something that they don't need to do anyway, so why would they do it? Um, part of, with, with open data, when we started, when we rebooted DataGovU, like what, three, almost three years ago, um, we, we started from the premise that no agency really deeply wants to open data. Now, that was just a premise. I wasn't saying it's a reality, but we started from that premise because all of the discussions about the value of open data was about the value to citizens and the value to business. There was no discussion about what's the value to government. And so basically a lot of the open data program was being driven by enthusiasts and being driven by agencies that had a, a mandate to open data as opposed to being a whole of government kind of approach. So what we did, and again, this might help you, is we did the research to understand what is the value of open data to government with the understanding that if government agencies want to publish data naturally as a natural part of their what they do, that will or, you know, that will absolutely have the benefits to the public and to business and to transparency that, you know, that we care about. Um, so we did that research and we found some really key ways that open data helps departments, helps them be more efficient, more effective, better services, better decision making, all that kind of good stuff, right? And when we started to talk to agencies about why it's good for them, what's in it for them, how it would save them time and money and all that kind of good stuff, then again, they had a motivation to do it. So sometimes it's not about, sometimes they don't think they want to do something, even though you know it's what they need to do. So part of that risk management isn't just about helping them mitigate the risks. It's also about helping them understand the benefit because agencies will do something if they have to because there's a problem or if they want to because there's a, there's a benefit. So you can play both of those games simultaneously and usually get them over the line for, for, for certain things. Sometimes it might take a bit of time and that long game is tiring and frustrating sometimes. But so the third thing I'll suggest is to make sure you surround yourself with peers and that you keep in, in contact with other people that will help you maintain the rage because otherwise it can get very tiring sometimes. But, um, but yeah, so, so engage with the risks but also engage with the benefits and help them understand why this will help their organisation. Does that make sense? Thank you. There was one right, more hand from over here somewhere. Okay. Um, uh, the other the other question got answered. Um, so um, please go ahead. Oh wait, no, there's one over here. Sorry. Hi. Um, I'm actually an archaeologist, and I do a lot of work with GIS. Uh, my question is. They open up more and more of the data, particularly um, the GIS data, which is fantastic. My problem with it is a lot of it is crap, and it's actually almost to the point of unusable crap. Um, so what do I do with that? <laughs> cool. All right, one of my favourite topics. So data. Um, <clears throat> when we first started with open data, 
we found that the government landscape was basically there were some agencies that are data specialists. So, you know, Bureau of Statistics are specialists in statistics. Geoscience Australia knows a lot about um, science data. Um, you have a, a few agencies that um, were starting to come to understand their internal data sets well and use them okay. But generally speaking, most people didn't know what the hell we were talking about. I remember one agency, and I'm not kidding, walking into the room that we were having a meeting about open data, putting a printed copy of the annual report on the desk and saying, we already do open data, what's the problem? Now, with that range of, of thinking about what data is, what it means, what it, how it works, we, we had a lot of work to do. So um, the last two and a half years, the strategy, I mean, my, my original strategy was step one, um, encourage more publishing, step two, focus on quality, step three, focus on value realisation. Um, I, as, as usual, thought that they would be a lot shorter um, periods of time, but, um, but what I think, sorry? Oh, no, that's my feedback. Oh, that's, that's, don't worry, it's just me. Um, so so what, we, what we found is that we had a lot more work to do than we expected in just trying to get publishing happening at all. Now, those same agencies that had a, a policy of not publishing data are setting up internal data teams, are starting to do data publishing to data.gov.au or in their own infrastructure, are starting to automate data updates. I mean, we've got some really amazing high quality data sets on, on now that have never existed before, they're updated on a nightly basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis, but, but done properly. So there's three aspects to this. There's the metadata, data, and the API quality. Um, the metadata, because we're everyone to have a metadata schema for discovery that is common and it, that, that has massively helped with discovery of data, but it's no point discovering it if it's crap quality, right? So in terms of format, um, we, we have moved beyond publishing a scan of a printed spreadsheet as a PDF is data. We've moved beyond that now to them machine readable data and we've moved into having better APIs. Now a lot of agencies, well a lot of agencies are using data W infrastructure, which is CCAN plus a geo server on an Amazon server with um, a bunch of other little bits that we've developed. Um, and open source by the way, all of our codes on GitHub as you would expect. And um, but there's a bunch of agencies that want to publish on their own platforms and um, the real focus this year, or the next year really, the real focus is we've gone from 500 to effectively 6,000 data sets on data over year. The other 1,500 for what it's worth, we are sharing metadata of the state, territory, government right now. We should have all five of them shared soon so you can search for all data from any of them. So discovery is a problem that's all solved almost. The quality of data is the big one. So we had a very senior in government go and use data over you, look at you know, do a search for a term. And then the first data set that he found, when you click through it, it was down. And it was just like, that is not a good reflection. Um, and the data set happened to belong to the Antarctica division who had amazing data, but the APIs are down and sometimes don't take a huge amount of load and those kinds of things. Yeah? <laughs> that, that was me attempting to give a time indication. Sorry? That was me attempting to um, give you a five-minute warning. Oh, <laughs> uh, in a very subtle way that didn't involve me talking to the whole room like this. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to shut up now. Okay. Yes. Sorry, say it again. Okay. I'll also put you on silent when I speak, that might help. Um, so, so quality is the big focus now. Um, and by focusing on, I, no, I didn't mute you, just, it was good advice, Ryan, I was just, anyway. Um, quality is the big focus now, not just the quality of data and getting them to actually publish data in a machine-readable format, but also to make sure that the APIs that are generated are high quality as well. Now, part of the problem of the question, I didn't see who the speaker was, sorry, but, Part of the problem is that 
even if you have great metadata and a great data format and great, you know, easy to use, reliable APIs, the data inside the data <laughs> might still be pretty bollocksy. Um, that's going to improve over time. So what we're doing to make life easier for everybody and to also encourage more government departments to actually put a focus on quality, and you're going to love this, is, and we sort of announced this publicly yesterday, we've got a new blog up now that we've moved into Prime Minister and Cabinet. So check it out, blog.data.gov.au. Uh, um, what we're going to do is we're going to launch a quality framework. I know that sounds wanky, but every when you go to data.gov.au, you will effectively have a five-star rating on the quality, on the um, uh, on, on a couple of things, on the quality of the metadata, the quality of the data, and the quality of the API. And the fourth thing will be a public quality meter. So you will be able to say, you know what, it may be a good API and good format and good metadata, but the actual internal data is awful, so I'm going to give it one star. Um, this means that everyone, and they've actually already got this in place in the UK, but we think um, but it only looks at formats. It doesn't look at API quality or any of the other things. So, so we're hoping that what this means is that when you or anyone you know looks for data on DataGovU and finds a data set that you think might be useful, it, you will have a very in-your-face understanding of whether it's of a high enough quality that you can use. Because you want to understand, you know, will the API be up on a Saturday afternoon when my stakeholders want to use my application? Um, will, the, will the data set continue to be updated on a regular basis? So we're going to be putting in place something that looks at quality from those four perspectives at first, and we might adapt it over time based on feedback. But it's also going to look at um, quantity, efficiency, and value. How much, how many data sets, and there'll be a bit of a ranking, and how um, much time and money, so how much efficiency have agencies realized through their data being published, and how much value, so how much public use has there been of the data, both through downloads, views, API calls, all that but also how many use cases can we find, how many applications, those kinds of things. So we'll be putting this in place hopefully over the next month or two, and um, and that will feed a league table. So the league table will help agencies know how they rank against other agencies from a quality, quantity, efficiency, and value perspective, and then it'll be broken down so you can say, well, all of our data is at least three-star in terms of Four star in terms of metadata, but it's only you know an average of one star in terms of quality, and the public you know are only voting it consistently at zero stars. So you know that maybe we need to work on that. So we're putting in this in place now. It wouldn't have made sense to put in place before now because you needed to have a tipping point of data being published and a tipping point of momentum around this space. But now that there is a strong government agenda to publish more data, uh, is the right time for us to put this league table in place. So. I think that that will, first of all, make it easy for people to identify the data that they feel confident to use, and second of all, will put pressure on agencies to improve the quality of their data. And um, and in a lot of cases, um, they say it's too hard, and we go and work with them, and we're able to show them um, ways to do it that are a lot easier than they assume. Because frankly, the technology has come a long way in the last few years. I, ho I hope that answers the question. Does that is that okay? Oh, I need to unmute you now. Sorry. <laughs> no, now you're muted. I'm sorry. I muted you and I can't unmute you. Hang on. Oh, no, we're not. Clicky. Clicky. Oh, look, I don't know. I, there we I, go. I don't know how to use these fancy trackpad things. <laughs> um, uh, that did answer the question. Um, we're sort of at the... Um, end of this session time, but does anybody want to keep hearing from Pia for a couple more minutes? Yeah, we've got a general. Let's 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 keep doing stuff for a few more minutes. So, sure. what else you got for me? Uh. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm genuinely interested whether um, GovHack and all this stuff's been going on for a few years now, whether you still have government departments that still have no idea what GovHack is and are genuinely surprised that you exist. I, I'm afraid that I lost the tail end of the conversation. You're genuinely interested in... If there are any government 
organisations or local councils, state departments that have not heard of GovHack yet? Um, so seven out of eight, hold on, let me, let me think. So let's start, start at the bottom. So about this year, I think about a, uh, a dozen local councils got involved. Now there's about 500 all up, so obviously there's a bit of work to do there. Um, just give me just one second. That's actually my boss. I'll just let them know I'll be there. I'll be a few minutes. Um, but, um, from the state government perspective, um, there, let me think, every state government except for one, so seven out of eight state and territory governments um, know about and regularly participate, whether formally or informally now with, with, data, uh, with, with GovHack, which is great. And at the federal level in terms of individual departments and across all of those jurisdictions, a lot of departments get involved, um, some more so than others. Queensland, a huge amount of departments. South Australia, Western Australia, a huge amount of departments get involved from all of those states, which is cool. Um, at the federal level, this year I think we had 15 federal government departments involved. Um, I think that that number continues to grow, but it's really funny because it's not just GovHack. What ends up happening is GovHack as an event starts getting um, <laughs> reported in things like the annual innovation report for government where they're like, oh, well, here's one of our big events for the year. And we're like, cool, but you don't run it. <laughs> um, but so a lot of people in government hear about GovHack as part of other government departments sort of saying, oh, this thing happened and it was amazing. We got all these great outcomes and, and here's our report from it and here's our media release. So, so that's been really interesting. And, I mean, considering that people got so angsty about the word hack being in GovHack and they still, I mean, every year we still get someone saying, oh, you're breaking into systems. And every year I take the opportunity with a smile and with a, a, a huge amount of grace because that's the best way to teach people encouragingly. And I talk to them about, oh, no, it's, it's about civic hacking. It's about hacker, hacker ethos. It's about making, not breaking, and all that good stuff. And every year I feel we're getting a little closer to, you know, fixing the problem, but then a media, you know, then the next media story will come about about someone hacking into someone and we, you know, and then we're going to start again. But that's all right. Yeah, so genuinely I think it has become quite well known. We now have several other countries wanting to participate. Um, I don't know if the volunteers are, are, are you know, could possibly be stretched too much more than we volunteers and, um, and it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's good. Um, you have all your foot soldiers ready and waiting, Pia. What's next in the revolution? What do you need us to do? <laughs> uh. Thanks, Donna. Um, it, it's actually funny. I think I think the best thing we can all do is to do what we do um, because through doing what we do, uh, we show people a different way. We live the change that we want to see, all that kind of good stuff. We be the change we want to see. Um, but I think part of it is also about just, you know, assuming, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but people assume the worst of government. They assume it's nefarious. They assume it's evil. They assume, you know, everyone working in it must be morons. And that's always struggle, you know, a, a bit challenging. Um, can I just, I guess one thing would be to just assume um, incompetency first <laughs> um, or, or assume that someone just doesn't know better. Often enough, someone's making an assumption coming from a place of their experience or their ignorance or their understanding of the world. And we've got so much to share with these people. We need to bring them on the ride. And so we need to recognise that we are the pioneers of the modern age. And that means we have a responsibility to bring people along with us and not just leave them in the cold um, as we storm towards paradise. Um, so partly it's about taking on that, that role as leaders and as people who are so well equipped in the modern world, surrounded by so many people that aren't, um, and, and trying to help them actually come along with us. I think that's, that's a big one. But, um, but basically just rock. Just be awesome. And if you're awesome, everyone around you will be like, I want, I want that. I want, I want to be like that. And, um, and that, that's the best way that we can influence the world around us, I think. And I think that's actually a fantastic um, note to stop on. 
Um, so I'd like to thank you. Um, you can't see me. This is terrible. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much, Virtual Peer, for being with us. Um, we have a speaker gift for you, um, which I, um, we, do you have a 3D printer? We can scan it and you can, no, wait. Um, um, Paul Waper. What is it? I'm about to open it. Um, Donna, can you please assist? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's in paper at the moment, but we're going to get it closer to the camera. Um, It's like Christmas. Ooh, that's pretty. I like it. Uh, no, yes, you can. It, no, the other way up. <laughs> All right. Um, Paul, Paul, I'll get one, Paul Wiper. I'll get a schema. I'll get a friend up here to print it. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, Paul Wiper will actually be delivering you this um, delightful little wooden box. Um, so thank you again, Pia. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be there. And um, thank you all so much for just being wonderful and inspiring and just, you know, making it all worth it. Really appreciate it. Can we get the whole room somehow? That's awesome. <laughs> and now I'm seasick. Uh. <laughs> All right. I got to go, guys. Thank you so much. See you Cheers. later. Cheers. Thanks again. Bye.